Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you all and excited to talk about accessibility and inclusivity. So a quick primer again, I'm Kaya, and I'm an iOS engineer currently at Calm, which is a meditation, relaxation, and sleep app. Um, I was at Slack for a couple of years where I worked on messaging and notifications, and I'm the founder of Reread2, which is an app on children's and young adult books written by authors of color featuring characters of color. So today we're going to chat a lot about what is accessibility, what does being inclusive mean, and what the are the differences between the two. I'll tell you a bit about my journey and how I got into accessibility, and then we'll talk about the practical applications of how to actually audit your app for accessibility and how to bake inclusivity into your product process. So let's get started. What actually is accessibility? Accessibility is the process of creating products that are usable by all people. And this is incredibly important, especially when we talk about accessibility in technology. We're specifically talking about accessibility for folks with differing abilities. About 15% of the world's population lives with some form of disability. So if you're building something that is inaccessible, that means you're alienating 15% of the world's population. There are so many different types of abilities. You have visual disabilities, whether someone's blind, they suffer from low vision or color blindness. You have auditory disabilities, whether someone is deaf or hard of hearing. You have cognitive disabilities like dyslexia, ADHD, epilepsy. And then you have mobility or motor disabilities like cerebral palsy and paralysis. And there are many, many more. So when you think about building technology, you have to think about all these different types of life experiences. So now I already defined accessibility, but how do you actually define inclusive? Because they're actually very different things. I love this definition by education researcher. Inclusion implies being included. To include means to consider as part of a whole. Thus, inclusion means to participate in and be a part of. So inclusion really is about welcoming someone in and recognizing that they deserve to have great experiences regardless of whatever their background or life experience is. Now, hearing that definition of accessibility and inclusion, how many of you feel confident that you understand the difference between the two? Okay, that's about what I expected, <laughs> and that's fine. So, let me explain it like this. Think about you go to the gym, right? And the gym, the gym decides that it wants to be more accessible. So for the entrance, they create a ramp so that folks with wheelchairs can then enter into the gym. Now, this may be an accessible gym now, but it's not necessarily an inclusive gym. And why is that? Because although that they have had this ramp, that now allows people to enter in, they haven't changed anything actually about the experience of the gym itself. So they're not necessarily creating an experience that folks who would use the wheelchair ramp would enjoy. They might not necessarily enjoy being in the gym because the gym hasn't changed anything about the equipment or the courses that it might offer. So if they want to go the extra mile and create an inclusive experience, they might think about how they can make the equipment more usable for all or how can they offer phys ed courses that everyone can participate in. So that's the subtle difference between accessibility and inclusion. Accessibility is that first step. So it's allowing someone to use it or enter in, whereas inclusion is going the extra mile to make sure that that experience is enjoyable for everyone. So when you're building an app, you may have already thought a little bit about accessibility. And you may have taken those initial steps. But inclusion is saying, I'm going to put in the effort to ensure that no matter who this person is or how they experience life, they can enjoy my app in the same way. And to bring this point home, I wanted to show this video that I think really shows how much of a difference building an inclusive experience can make. My name is Grover. Sean. My name is Ian. I'm Taylor. My name is Owen. And I am nine and a half years old. I only have one. <laughs> and yeah. I love video games, my friends, 
my family, and again video games. <laughs> Whenever I play it, it makes me feel happy. The fun that you get to have with connecting with your friends. You make your own rules. It's his way of interacting with his friends when he can't physically otherwise do it. When I'm playing with a regular controller, there's some things that don't work for me. It's difficult for me to use both joysticks and the D-pad at the exact same time. And it just slowed me down a bunch more while other people were like She's never had the freedom to play at the level she knows she could. I never thought it was unfair. I just thought, hey, this is the way it is and it's not gonna change. What I like about the adaptive controller is that now everyone can play. I don't even have to look at the controller and just be like looking at the screen like, hey, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. You never want your kid to feel like an outsider or an other. One of the biggest fears early on is, how will Owen be viewed by the other kids? <laughs> He's not different when he plays. It's a little challenging, but that's the whole point of gaming. I can hit the buttons just as fast as they can. And I think I can crush my friends. <laughs> no matter how your body is or how fast you are, you can play. It's a really good thing to have in this world. I know that was a Microsoft ad, but <laughs> and we're, we're iOS engineers, but I think it just brings home that going the extra mile can make a huge difference in people's lives. So although those kids can use the previous controllers, it wasn't a great experience. So Microsoft decided to make those adaptive controllers that made the gaming experience better for everyone. So how did I actually get into accessibility and learning more about inclusion? Well, it all started when I did a summer internship at Apple, where I was working on the macOS accessibility team, specifically the team that makes VoiceOver, the screen reader for the Mac. And when I started my summer internship, I went to my manager, all excited, ready to work on cool stuff, and I asked him what my summer project was going to be. And he asked me this question, how can you make Xcode a better experience for blind programmers? Now, raise your hand if you were asked that question, you'd be able to answer it. <laughs> exactly. I had no idea. Um, it was really an eye-opening moment for me because I, it was something I sadly never even thought about. Whenever I was using Xcode or programming, I was just thinking about my own experience. So what I had to do is actually go out and meet blind programmers, talk to folks who were on our QA team, and ask them what their experience was like. And what they told me blew my mind. So how they actually would program is they would memorize the code character by character. So if you, tell, if you ask them what letter or symbol is at character 306, they would be able to tell you. But think about how inefficient that would be if that's how you had to program, by memorizing each character of code you wouldn't really be able to get much done and your experience would be way less productive. So it was something that really opened my mind to how different the life experience can be depending on what type of abilities that you have. So what I end up doing is trying to make that experience better through using the rotor system in VoiceOver. So essentially I implemented uh, the ability for those programmers to easily switch between method and method in a, line, in a file. So that, that, that way they didn't have to go character by character or try to memorize a whole file of code at one time. They could use this rotor system to easily jump method to method and that way they can have smaller chunks of code to look at. So that was just a small thing I did, but it made a huge difference in their lives. And that's how we have to think about this when we're thinking about accessibility and inclusion. Another eye-opening experience I had that summer is I got to meet Heben Germa. And this is a quote by her. All barriers that exist are created by society. As members of society, we play a role in removing those barriers and making sure that everyone can access information and opportunities. Heben Garma is the first deaf-blind person to graduate from Harvard Law School. She's a disability advocate, and she's incredibly smart. She's a wonderful person, and she speaks around the world trying to advocate for disabilities. So this is something that we 
we all have a responsibility towards. No matter how you experience life, especially as engineers, we really have a responsibility to make sure that our software is usable by all. So now that I've talked about all this, how do you actually go about doing it? There are a couple of ways that you can audit your app for accessibility, but first you have to understand what tools are available for folks of varying disabilities on iOS. So for visual impairments, there's VoiceOver, which is a screen reader that allows someone to navigate and interact with apps on the iPhone. There's also Invert Colors, which turns the screen to essentially a grayscale for folks who are colorblind and helps them be able to differentiate between elements on the screen. There's Dynamic Type, which allows you to adjust the font size for any application that you may use. And for more on dynamic type, I highly recommend going to Elena's talk tomorrow at 12.25, where she's going to go into great technical depth about that. There's a magnifier, which allows you to zoom in on the screen. For audio disabilities, there's live listen, LED flash. The LED flash is a really cool tool that Usually, if you get a sound notification, instead of a sound notification, it will flash the flashlight to let someone who can't hear that sound notification know what's going on. For cognitive disabilities, there's speech screen typing feedback for folks who are dyslexic or who need more feedback on how they're, how they're actually writing something and if they're not correctly spelling, etc. There's guided access who, for folks who need more focus and who want to just interact with one app at a time without being able to go into other things. For motor impairments, there's switch control, which essentially allows someone who may not have access for, to all their hands, if they maybe just you know, can use their mouth and a straw, they might blow into a straw and that lets the screen know where to stop. Or they might just use their thumb and select a button and then assistive touch so you can access all of the gestures if you're not able to actually make the gestures on the touch screen. So luckily, Apple takes accessibility very, very seriously, and they've offered a wide array of tools for customers to use when they're interacting with different apps. And us, for, as developers, we have UI accessibility. And UI accessibility is in the iOS SDK, and it allows us these APIs to really make sure that our apps are accessible to folks who are using those tools. So this one is probably the most important. <laughs> this is for any element that you might make in your app. Is accessibility element? This lets Apple know that you want that element to be known to someone who is, let's say, using voiceover. Right? Because sometimes you actually might want to hide an element, or if you have a really complex custom view that has a bunch of subviews and such, you want to make sure that you are showing the correct element on the screen. So you may want to set some to false and some to true. Then we have accessibility label. And this is really important for the screen reader because it lets the person know what the element actually is. Then we have value, and value is important if you have some type of element that has an inferred numeric value. So if there is like a slider, that if someone visually would be able to see what that slider is and what the value is, you would set the accessibility value so that a person who can't actually see the element and infer the value, they can know what that value is. And then you have traits, which allow the person who's using the screen reader to know what type of element it is. So if it's a button, if it's static text, if it's a link, and that way they know what they are able to do with it. And then accessibility hint is a really great one, especially if you have a bunch of custom, uh, custom actions or you know, custom complex views. You, this one allows you to give a hint to the screen reader that says, this is what this element is or this is what you can do with it. So let's see how, how good you all are at knowing what these attributes might mean. So here we have just the slider on the, the brightness in the settings screen. And VoiceOver will have um, an indicator, a focus indicator, which is where you see these black bars. So let's see if you can guess what these act attributes actually equal. So for the first one, I think this is the easiest one, right? Is accessibly Ill Ability element. Is this going to be true or false? All right. So that was an easy one. All right. What about accessibility label? Anybody feel confident that they know what that would be? Okay. Screen brightness. So close, not just brightness, but screen brightness. 
What about accessibility traits? Anybody know what the trait of a slider would be? Adjustable, yep. What about the value? This one's kind of hard, right? <laughs> okay, somebody said 50. Zero five. Any other guesses? Medium. Okay, so the person who said 50 was close. It's actually 56%. <laughs> so that one's a kind of hard one to guess. And lastly, what would be the hint on this one? This one's going to be really hard if somebody gets this. Adjust screen brightness, someone said. Use the rotor. Up, down. Sorry, no one's close. <laughs> so the up, down was pretty close, but there's a bit more descriptive, right? Swipe up or down with one finger to adjust the value. So the tips, the hints there are super important because it allows you to give some really specific info on what you can do with this. So the number one important thing you can do if you haven't done any accessibility work before is manually audit your app. So the, the first thing you can do is set an accessibility shortcut. So if you go to the general settings app and go to general accessibility and shortcut, you can select which tool that you want to use to audit your app with. And if you have an iPhone X or above, you can triple tap to turn on this shortcut. Or if you have um, a phone with a home screen, you can triple tap the home screen, and it'll turn on that tool. Um, and this is a great way to play with different accessibility tools to see how your app interacts with it. And then, of course, while you're actually programming, if you're working in the simulator, the accessibility inspector is going to be your best friend. So you can open this up in the Xcode menu by selecting Open Developer Tool and then selecting the Accessibility Inspector. So this will allow you to select any element or view in the simulator for your app and see what the accessibility values are and attributes. So you can see what the label would be, you can see if there's any value there, if it has a type, if it has any hints or traits, and then you can even perform actions. Another cool thing you can do is right in the Accessibility Inspector, you can try to navigate the view hard Hierarchy. So you can move to the parent element, you can move to the next element, and you can see if your view hierarchy actually works with the, with the screen reader. Another thing that I haven't talked about that much, but I wanted to mention because it's important, another aspect of accessibility is connectivity. Depending on where folks live, they might have different access to internet and different internet speeds. So it's definitely something that's important and you should test out in your app. You can test this out in the code, so if you have any features that heavily, heavily rely on networking and you need to ensure that the person is connected to the internet, the network framework that um, I, the Apple came out with last year is really, really great. Um, if you were using Reachability, which is a third-party library before, the network framework allows you to easily not have to use a third-party framework. Um, no, no shade against third-party frameworks, but <laughs> it's just an easy way to c test connectivity without having to have a Cocoa Pod or Carthage in there. And then the network link connector in the developer tab for settings is a great way to play around on the device to see if you have 100% loss or very bad network, how your app would um, respond in that way. So now let's talk a bit about the product process. So when you're developing features, um, when you're working on a team of a lot of people, how can you think about um, inclusivity on a more regular basis? So there are a couple of ways to go about it. One way is if you're a larger, if you work for a larger company, I think that this is a really important step, is having usability or focus groups where you actually meet with folks who live these life experiences and see what their experience is using your app. Apple has great focus groups of folks of varying disabilities that they have who use the betas before they go out, and they get feedback from them and actually incorporate their feedback um, before they actually release any software. And I think this is important because the reality is, even if you're manually auditing your app or you're testing things out, you may not really know what the experience might be. So you may think you know what the experience is, but you don't know how the person actually uses the tool or how they interact with it. So actually getting feedback from real people, I think, is really important. 
Another way to do this is third party. So there are a lot of com accessibility companies that you can hire and they will be a part of your QA process. So before you release any new version of your app, you can give them you know, the, the new version that you want to release and they will do a run through and see if you missed anything. If you can't have a third party audit, your QA team, I think, is really, really important in this process. So if your QA team can have automated tests around voiceover and accessibility, that will help you also go the extra mile to ensure you're not missing anything and not, no regressions are happening when you're releasing new versions of the app. So these are questions that I think, when you're developing new features, you should try to incorporate when you're thinking about who is going to be using these features when you're working with your product managers, right? Think about what are ways that we can make this feature more better and more accessible to folks who experience life very differently from ourselves. How can we make accessibility a requirement or blocker for launching this feature? And this one might be a bit controversial, right? Especially if you work at a startup or, or someone that's, they're telling you to move really fast or ship really fast, but you can't degrade the quality, right? Quality is very important. And so if you're alienating folks by shipping this feature really fast and not actually thinking about the accessibility components, you're making the experience worse off for people of varying disabilities. And then if you're making this new feature, are you thinking that maybe even if you make this feature accessible, is there something about it that can potentially alienate folks? Are those conversations that you're having when you're making new features for your app? And then lastly, is there any way to automate this process? We're all engineers, right, and we love automation. So if there's any way that you can automate it, I think that will really help you go out the extra mile without having to think about it. Because as we as humans, we often forget. So if you can automate it and make sure that it's always happening, then you can prevent that forgetfulness. So to wrap things up and to give a short overview of what we've gone over, Remember that accessibility does not equal inclusivity. Accessibility is that first step, but inclusivity is going that extra mile to make sure that your app is a great experience to anyone, regardless of their ability or background. And then lastly, a mixture of manual and automated auditing will be essential in ramping up accessibility for your applications. And before we end out, I just want to share some resources with you all if you're interested in learning more and going the doing the next step and going that extra mile. The, obviously, Apple's accessibility docs are going to be incredibly important in doing so. But I highly recommend watching these two videos, the first being Hibben Garma's speech from the 2016 WWC, Disability and Innovation, the Universal Benefits of Accessibility, Accessible Design. And then lastly, deliver an exceptional accessibility experience from last year's WWDC. This one was a great, great video where they really go in depth about how to actually build an inclusive experience, experience that's actually great for the user, regardless of whether, whatever their background is. Thank you so much for listening. And if you have any questions, I would love to hear from you in chat. I think we have time for one or two questions. Awesome. Any questions? Someone? All right, we have a mic runner. Oh, awesome. Got it. Okay, you were talking about uh, automating accessibility testing. Mm -hmm. Is uh, there a particular thing that you would recommend automating first? to get started. Uh, yes, for new definitely. People. Like for the automated aspect of it? Yes. Yeah. So um, there are a couple of ways. So you can use accessibility um, tests for your UI testing. So there are two ways to do it. One way um, I advise against. So if you're using accessibility labels for your UI testing, I think it's the easiest way to do it, especially if you're using something like KIF. But the problem there is if you have the accessibility labels that are like just tech jargon, and they're not actually real labels, so if it's just like 
blue underscore button, that's creating a really terrible experience for um, screen reader users. So I highly recommend using accessibility identifiers. So you can set those to be whatever you want, but it ensures that the elements are accessibility elements. So that's actually one way that you can ensure that specific elements that you want to be accessibility elements are there on the screen through using UI testing. Um, and then, depending on what your QA team uses, I know that there are a lot of teams that have um, automated tests that run that ensure that they do certain manual tests, a mixture of automated and manual. So I think it depends on whichever processes you use. But in terms of on the developer side, I think using accessibility identifiers are definitely a great way in your UI testing to ensure that the accessibility elements are present. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for your talk. Oh, thank you. Any other questions? Awesome. Hey, um, do you have any um, switch control suggestions? Like, I know that those are things that are often kind of hard to get and or use. Yeah. Um, is there anything that either you've used or, or you've seen people use to test all of that stuff? I haven't seen any automated ways to, to test switch control, unfortunately. The best way to do it is that manual testing. I think where, where, it comes, where switch control really comes into play is making sure that your tap targets are, are really good. So if you have like any custom actions, um, ensuring that your, your tap targets are really wide because with switch control, basically it scans the X horizon and then the Y horizon, and then they have to basically match up so it's really frustrating if the tap target is super small and they can't actually get that area. So I think that's one way to think about it, I mean, ensuring your tap tar targets are, are larger there. Um, but it has to be tested manually. I, that's the only way that I know of. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. Any other thoughts, questions? Oh, OK, you got one over here. Thank you for your talk. Um, I have a question regarding design references. Do you mm -hmm. have any? Because I think accessibility and inclusivity should mm -hmm. start at the, not the dev development yep. phase, but when it's designed. Yeah. And uh, so yep. maybe the question is more: How do you recommend to work with a design team? Yeah, that's a really, really important one. I think that comes into play a lot too when you think about like color schemes um, and like the colors that you're using and the kits that you're using. There was a really good um, resource, and I can try to share it in the Slack, about grayscale um, and making sure that whatever color scheme that you're using works well with grayscale. Like if you have an app that shows or presents graphs or pie charts, it can be really hard if your color scheme is not, um, if it's too subtle, right? If you're using like all blue, let's say, then if somebody inverts colors, it's just gonna look like a gray blob. So making sure that your design team is aware of that. And there's also the um, W3, like accessibility, um, color, color accessibility that you can test. So you can test two colors and test their color contrast to ensure that they match accessibility standards. So I think presenting those tools to your design team will be really important. Um, that's one way to go about it. But I think definitely having the conversation and ensuring that they're thinking about these things will be really important. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>